Is everybody in? Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. This is very real. Fantastic. This drug is dangerous. Wrong. You cannot play with it. It's not funny. It's, it's not something to laugh about. Good people don't smoke marijuana. Shut your little punk ass up. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. Well, hello, my friends, and welcome to episode 35 of the Autoflower Podcast. I hope you guys are doing well. I'm your host, Chad Delaney. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, for stopping by, for slapping them earbuds in and just cranking me and my the guests through your speakers. I appreciate you guys. And uh, before we get started, as always, please allow me to remind you to follow the podcast on Instagram at Autoflower Podcast. You can like the Facebook page and you can also follow on Twitter at Autoflower Pod. You're also welcome to visit the website at www.autoflowerpodcast.com. Our guest this week is a returning guest, Dr. MJ Coco, one of my favorites. He is going to be joining us to chat about lighting. LEDs, grow lights, efficiency, PAR, PPF, all these different fancy terms. So once again, might want to get out a dictionary or jot down some notes. Be sure to check out his new video that he's got out on YouTube. It's called Grow Light Physics, Coverage Area and Running Arrays with the Mars Hydro SP3000. He's also got some other great uh, light videos on his YouTube channel. Also, don't forget to visit his website, CocoForCannabis.com. There's a grow light calculator there. There's a grow light guide. There are grow light tests and reviews that you can go through and read and soak up all the knowledge that you want to. I want to give a big shout out to Christopher, our newest Patreon member. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for signing up for the Flowering Club. I hope you enjoy your free seeds. Well, let's get into this conversation about lighting. I hope you guys enjoy this. I hope you learn something. I hope you walk away with a better understanding and maybe even a new grow light in mind. So help me in welcoming back to the Autoflower Podcast, Dr. MJ Coco. pretty uneducated on it and um and then another thing that i think it would be beneficial is because i still it it, it just makes me cringe seeing uh on a lot of the facebook groups a lot of the people just buying these um really cheap uh, not to stereotype but really cheap like chinese lights you know like still just blurple city like blurple is like still hot and 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 selling heavy it's it's pretty amazing uh, it's because they've come it's so a lot far. of yeah, a lot of deception, deceptive marketing practices. So uh, yeah, I would love to sort of talk about that and and could give some numbers to sort of show what you're really getting out of that, um, mm-hmm. what you're paying for and what you're getting. Blur pulls are not um, a, a good deal. <laughs> Yeah, and it's amazing because I'll I'll see quite often, as a matter of fact, people posting a, like a link to a blurple on Amazon on a Facebook group saying, "Hey, what's everyone think about this light?" And then some people are like, "Yeah, I have that one. It's great." And yeah, and I look at it and it's like 150 bucks, and I'm like, "Okay, you know, for 150 bucks, like you can get a way better light that yes. is going to give you much much better buds." And, and yeah. so, but I just, well, when you and, come and in and even, say that, yeah, when you there's come different in and ways say to that, think though, about it. there's upset. different sort of things to pay attention to when you're, when you're thinking about how expensive a, a light really is, you need to think about sort of how much it costs per how much light it puts out. Um, and when we do the math on that, those blurples end up being a little bit more expensive than um, the sort of entry level high efficiency LEDs. Um, so, so what, with the blurple light, I'll, I get into this. Most blurple lights get about one micromole per watt. So when we're thinking about light, and when you're thinking about how much light you need in your tent or whatever in your grow space, um, you're you're really thinking about how many photons, 
you want bombarding your plants. Um, and we measure photons in micromoles. So we're thinking about how many micromoles of light do you need to cover a grow space? Um, we recommend that you get an average of uh, 700 micromoles per square meter, um, which is 65 micromoles per square foot. Now, most of the blurple lights, these um, and other even full spectrum of the box LED style lights with the, the integrated fans in a box, mm -hmm. um, those fixtures generally get between 0.9 and 1.2 micromoles per watt. So it's pretty easy to just say they get about one micromole per watt. So mm -hmm. if you're running um, you know, 300 watts, you're going to get 300 micromoles. Um, if the fixture it draws 150 watts from the wall, then it's 150 micromoles. And if you're paying $150 for that, then that would be $1 per micromole, right? Okay. Um, when you think about it in terms of the dollars per micromole, most blurple lights are more expensive than the entry level high efficiency LEDs like the TS series from Mars, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the TS series from Mars comes in at less than 50 cents per micromole, but uh, and the, the blurples usually come in at like 55 to 60 cents per micromole when you think about how much light versus how much they cost. Um, now, it often appears that you're saving money with the blurple, but that's just because they lie about how much light it produces and they try to trick you into thinking it has a larger coverage area than it actually does, or that it produces more light than it actually does, or that it replaces some absurd HPS that's just insane. Um, those HPS sort of replacement values are just, I mean, pure BS that's made up. Um, there's no sort of scientific equivalency on that. I actually um, talk about that in some of my videos. I talked about that in my Vipar Spectra video where the Vipar Spectra fixture was claiming that it was the equivalent of a 400 watt HPS. And I showed that it was roughly the equivalent of a 200 watt HPS. Um, uh -huh. So those sort of uh, HPS comparison numbers that the manufacturers like to put out are they're just ways to sort of trick and deceive growers into thinking they're getting more light. Um, and so what happens if you get a blurple, you're spending a little bit more per micromole and then you're getting sort of less light for the amount of electricity that you're running all throughout the grow. Um, so there's really, I mean, it's not even sort of up for a debate. Um, the the blurple technology, that whole box LED style of technology is outdated. We've moved past that in the sort of ability to efficiently deliver light um, and to deliver light at a cost effective point. So um, a lot of the stuff that you're seeing now is, is sort of inventory sell off. The major manufacturers, people like Mars Hydro, people like v Vipar Spectra, they're moving really strongly away from that style of lights. Mm -hmm. um, you still have a lot of sort of components and, and stuff out there and they're trying to sell it to uneducated growers. Um, and that's really one of the main things that we're trying to do with the, with the Cocoa for Cannabis Grow Light Guide project is to sort of educate growers about how to evaluate lights and how not to get duped by manufacturers. Um, so our calculator, we have a, a cool grow light calculator that allows you to sort of enter data about different lights. If you're looking at a blurple light, we have a whole a blurple um, setting in our calculator that you can say this is a blurple light and it draws this many watts. Um, and it'll tell you what you should actually expect from that light in terms of uh, usable photosynthetic flux, photon flux, um, the number of photons, the micromoles of photons that you'd be getting. Um, and, and you can do sort of a better comparison there between sort of what's the upfront cost, what's the electricity cost, how much light am I actually getting from this um, to be able to compare different fixtures. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting because I started growing with a Viper Spectra. The uh -huh. I don't I don't even remember which one it was. It's a a small one. Um, but I started growing with that, and it's like not only were my plants, you know, relatively small, they were also pretty fluffy. And yeah, uh, and then I what's, added. Well, what size? Do you know how many watts of that Viper Spectra you had? I think it was a like a. 
300 or something like but the watts actual draw was like around 100 from the wall okay yep yep um yeah the the vibrant selector 300 um i think it drew like 150 actually maybe yeah maybe that that sounds more accurate um, the 450s long. drew just over 200 so that seems yeah right. yeah that's what that's another was. thing that they just sort of lie and make up numbers and i i <laughs> i don't know where <laughs> they get the 300 and the 450 it, it's marketing it's not sort of Sounds a scientific fancy. description of the light yeah um and, okay, so you had one of those. Is that yeah? I had said? one of those and a two by two tent, and then okay, I had so ended that's up. That's underlit. Yeah, totally. That's why. Now it's not necessarily because of the quality of the light, although the quality of the light is also worse. Mm -hmm. So blurble, blurble lights exist because early in, in generations of LED diodes were much more efficient at producing light in the red and blue spectrums than they were in the rest of the spectrums. Mm -hmm. So it, it, to get a full spectrum LED chips was less efficient. And in order to sort of crank up the efficiency of the LED chips, manufacturers um, were sort of biased towards the red and the blue spectrum. It has nothing to do really with what's efficient for plant growth. Um, it's more efficient to have a full spectrum light than to use that blurple light. The blurple light is just because it's more efficient to create that light than it is to create full spectrum light. So okay. you are getting, with a blurple light, you're getting sort of inferior quality light. Um, but I don't think that that's the main reason for the LARF. The main reason for the LARF is because you didn't have enough total light for that space. Oh, I see. Um, so if you were using a light that only drew 150 watts or so, is probably only producing um, 150 micromoles of usable PPF. Um, and we talked <laughs> just moments ago, right? It's 60, our recommendations are 65 micromoles per square foot. Right. So if you have four square feet, you need 260 micromoles of light mm. to fully light four square feet. And you were operating with about 150. Right. So and then, you that, know, it's interesting. That's the, that's the main cause of LARF. People often think LARF comes from like having fan leaves blocking buds or stuff like mm -hmm. that. No, the, the main reason for ending up with LARF is when you have a plant that is larger than the amount of light that it's getting that it can support. So a plant with more budding sites than sort of the amount of micromoles of light that it, it's receiving oh, can fully develop all of those <laughs> budding sites. Um, and that's where you end up with, with having a larvae plant. Yeah. So then is, does a tint make that much of a difference then? Yes. Um, it does because it's it's reflecting all that light obviously it's reflecting a tremendous amount of light um having mm. not only a, a tent but having using the tent properly um so using the tent properly means you have the the plants as close as reasonable to each other and mm -hmm. to the walls you don't want to leave dead space. And almost every time I see a new grower setting up a grow, if they have a small plant and a large tent, that small plant is right in the middle of the large tent, about as far away from the walls as they can possibly get it, which means they're making absolutely no use of the reflection off of those walls. Mm -hmm. So if you have a little light in, in a big tent with a little plant, the, the light and the plant should be over in a corner. Ah, oh, interesting up against the walls take advantage mm -hmm. of that reflection off of the walls reflected photons are sort of hugely important that's actually one of the things um so you were just starting to watch my new video i just put out a, a video on on grow light physics and and this is yeah. one of the things that i sort of get into i don't do a, a test without walls but i do move the walls around Mm -hmm. um, so I start, for example, I do a four by four test with two SP 3000s and then a five by four test and then a five by five test. Mm -hmm. Just moving those walls back like that further away from the fixture um, lowers the PPFD readings 
even in the middle, even right under the fixture, because there's fewer photons that are coming back after having bounced off the wall to get to the middle. So when we mm. think about hanging up a light above a plant, we think the light's just going straight from the fixture to the plant, but mm -hmm. the light spreads out really quickly and starts bouncing off of the walls and then coming back at the plant. And all of those reflected photons contribute to the photon densities in the middle of sort of a, a grow tent. If you don't have walls at all, you lose sort of all of those photons that are to overspill is what it's mm. called, where they, they miss the canopy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that really dramatically affects the efficiency of a fixture. Um, and so we use walls that are positioned right up against the plants and that eliminates overspill. The light either hits the wall or it hits the plant. It doesn't have sort of a way to get past the plants and out of the space. Um, and then if you eliminate overspill like that, then you only have to think about reflective losses. Um, and reflective losses are significant. Even if you have a material that claims to be 99% reflective, you're going to lose about 20% of the photons every time that that light bounces. Um, and so you want to get really good reflective material and you want to put it right sort of up against the plants um, in order to maintain that. It, it, and that's what manufacturers sort of assume. That's how the lights are designed. And that's the only way that the edge PPFD values stay sort of high enough. Um, if you allow the light just to diffuse as it gets out to the edges there, it's very quickly in sort of suboptimal ranges. Putting a wall there really traps that light, bounces it back to the plants and keeps the, mm -hmm. that sort of density of light around the edges of your garden um, at an acceptable level, assuming oh, okay. you have enough light to begin with. Yeah. So if I'm going to grow in an open area, <clears throat> say in like my garage or in a room, um, uh -huh. and you're growing, let's say you're growing in like a, a three foot by five foot area or, you know, maybe a, a four foot by six foot area, um, would you suggest like putting up walls or, or buying a tent? Um, rather than just kind of yes. letting it sit under those lights, what, what would be better? Do you think a tent would be better or just painting the walls white or covering them in um, foil? Well, certainly, or... you know, mylar is a more reflective material than painting the walls white. Painting the walls white really, I mean, and if you have the walls in the right place, you can eliminate the overspill, but you get a much higher reflective loss with white walls than you would with a, a mylar material. Um, you can, you don't have to buy a tent though. You can just buy the Mylar if you have like the space for it. That's a lot cheaper. Um, they sell rolls of Mylar. I bought one to make the walls that I use to do my, my par testing. Mm. Um, and it's pretty sort of good stuff. I mean, it would be easy to work with. I think having worked with it a little bit, if you had a room and you wanted to like line the room, um, or even just hang down like sheeting, you could use this almost like sheeting around the plants. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it, it's worth that. I'll, I'll give you a number here in, in mm -hmm. those tests I was just talking about, um, the SP 3000 in the, in the four by four space, when I had them at 21 inches above the canopy, they produced uh, a thousand micromoles right in the center, right? Which is what we mm -hmm. want. When I put them in a five by five space, I had to lower the hanging height all the way down to 16 inches in order to get it back to 1,000. So, it, right. So I got it five inches closer because that it lost all of those reflected photons back from the wall. Um, it didn't lose all of them, but the walls were all moved further away. So fewer reflected photons were getting back to that hot spot right under the fixture, which meant that the direct light wasn't getting it all the way up to a thousand. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So it if also... you removed the walls all together, no photons are bouncing back off of right. them. You're only getting the direct light. And yeah, it, it's going to lower PPFD values all across the canopy. You would have to, in order to stay fully lit, you would have to hang the fixtures much closer to the plants, which means that their coverage area would be smaller, which means you would need more fixtures.
Right. And without knowing that info, too, you really, I guess, don't know how far away to hang that fixture from the plants. Because if you're, I guess, with what you're saying, it can't be just a, you know, rule of thumb across the board, you know, for everybody. That's that's really one of the the cool things that I show in that video. Yeah. Is how Mm -hmm. much hanging height has to change when grow space changes. Yeah. Um, and it's totally predictable. All my tests, when I run par tests, I keep the maximum PPFD at a thousand. Uh-huh. So I adjust the hanging height to get it back to a thousand. And when you move the walls further away, it, it's predictable that you have to lower the fixture to get mm. that thousand back again. Um, if you move the walls in, you'd have to raise the fixture again to keep it at 1,000. So the idea that there's sort of one set hanging height for fixtures that you need to stay at um, it is really a myth. There's sort of an average hanging height that manufacturers give you based on sort of how they think you're going to use this light. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the, to be perfectly honest with you, manufacturers aren't terribly concerned it seems with some of these variables um but the size space that you put the fixture in absolutely makes a difference and running in arrays like that makes it a difference too so using two fixtures together makes each of them sort of Mm -hmm. more efficient yeah that's interesting so you know sometimes i'll see a picture of uh, a four by eight tent, a huge tent. And, mm-hmm. uh, maybe they've just, you know, they're working their way up or whatever. And, and they might not really catch that part of it where they've got one single small grow light because they're, you know, saving up to get their other lights or what have you. It would actually be right. beneficial if they could almost make like a, a, a faux wall of some sort uh, yeah. or hang or something to bring least, those at walls. At the very least, if that's your situation, you have a small light now, you got a big tank, you're planning on expanding, you know, you're going to wait for your next paycheck. If if that's your situation, get that light and get those corner. plants at least into a corner. Right. Don't put them right in the middle of your yeah. four by okay. eight tent, as like far away from the, the the helpful walls. Think about the walls as being sort of like supplemental lighting for the plant, right? Yeah. Um, and yeah, and you could put up other kinds of walls. You know, in that stage of the grow, it's probably less important. Um, mm-hmm sort of maximizing PPFD readings across the canopy is less important during the vegetative growth period, which is actually, this exposes another little interesting thing. Growers often um, are convinced that plants need more light when they enter flowering, um, which is not true. The, The sort of photosynthetic ability of plants to absorb and process light does not change, not even a little bit between vegetative growth and flowering. Plants can use exactly the same amount of light. Um, And a good rule for that is up to about 1,000 micromoles of PPFD of of sort of the density. That's true in veg. That's true in flowering. Nothing changes there. What about for like a seedling or something? A seedling, yeah, you want to start them young. But seedlings really, by the time they're done with the seedling stage, that's like four nodes. They can be up at full PPFD at that point. Oh, okay. Um, Full PPFD is easier to achieve in a tent that's not full (laughs) because Mm -hmm. light is now also bouncing off the floor Mm. um so generally if you have and this is one reason that manufacturers recommend higher hanging heights during vegetative growth um Mm -hmm. one reason is the ppfd is going to be higher in an empty tent than it is in a full tent because plants absorb photons i mean that's sort of what they're doing. That's why we're giving them the photons. Um, Once they absorb those photons, the photons are are done. They're gone. If you have a tent that doesn't have plants, then nothing is absorbing those photons. They're just ricocheting off around the inside of the the tent. I mean, each ricochet costs them, but still um, they come back to the plant and that raises PPFD values all across the canopy. So one of the reasons you want to have the light higher during vegetative growth is you want it higher until the tent is full, because if the sort of reflective floor is exposed to to light, then um, that will help raise the PPFD values higher than what we sort of measure in a test. Um, The other reason though for that recommendation is really just because, you know, optimal lighting is less important during the vegetative growth stage. 
it's more important to be sort of right on the optimal lighting level while the plants are producing flowers. You don't have to be kind of right on that optimal level while they're in vegetative growth. So it's okay to have the fixture sort of cover a larger area or be higher hung. Um, but you don't uh, have to. The plants can use that full dose of light if you want to give it to them during vegetative growth. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting you're talking about the, how, it, you know, the photons reflect and stuff because I paused your video and there's a, a a little graphic up of the uh, of lines reflecting off the sides of the tent and and uh, like yes. this. Yes, yeah, that's, my that's, usable that's, PPF graphic. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool, man. That's interesting that you're talking about that. Yep. Yeah, I would highly suggest everyone watch this video um, because it looks like I'm only a little bit into it, but it looks it definitely looks like it's going deep into the rabbit hole and and. Of, of some scientific uh, stuff when it comes to this. Yeah, yeah, LED. a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now, so this is yeah. fun. But yeah, I worked really hard on it. I mean, I worked all of July, was sort of um, lost to that video, um, mm -hmm. but I started it in June. I didn't publish it until August. Um, so it was a, a big project that I was working on like 100% of the time. Um, and I, I do, I, I think that it's fun. I get into some really interesting things, talking about all of this and looking at how grow area size um, really affects the, the distribution and the density of photons. Mm. Um, if you're confused about any of these things, I tried to get into, um, and I think this is where you are in the video maybe um, with that graphic, I try to get into the background. Um, I do a little metrics primer review, talk about um, PPF and PPFD and sort of how they relate to yes. each other and, mm -hmm. and how to think about them. Um, and then I take those concepts and we run five different PAR tests and we're able to, to make predictions about the data and sort of see those relationships playing out in, you know, across those different tests. So um, I had a lot of fun with it. But, yeah, it's definitely a, a major production. Yeah. So where are we at with like cob lighting? Was that just kind of a short lived fad? Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I would say so. Um, there are certain advantages in cob. Um, primarily, those advantages, though, are in sort of build cost rather than in um, overall photon efficiencies. I think Migro probably brought cobs to their natural point of conclusion. He got his um cob style fixtures up to be like 2.1 micromoles per watt in efficiency um in usable ppf which mm -hmm. is really good um but he decided that in order to take the next step he'd have to go to an smd and a bar style fixture and that's what he's just released now with the the new micro array um, so pretty much top of the LED market now is completely dominated by LED bar style fixtures, mm -hmm. which serve to help really distribute the light really well, um, better than a cob. The cob's main sort of down point is it becomes basically like a, a single point fixture. Right. Um, and distribution is just worse from that. So... Mm -hmm. The distribution can be helped so much if you physically spread the light out um, in the fixture itself. And that's what the LED bars do. That's what the quantum board style does. Mm. Um, but the quantum board style isn't able to reach that level that the LED bar style is. So the top that we're seeing the quantum boards come in is still in the two point is like less than 2.2 um the the sort of top end led bars now are coming in at 2.3 oh okay yeah um, um that's my light for a while and now remember the the blurple lights we started talking about at the beginning of this mm -hmm. are one one wow. micromole per watt these yeah. led bars now i just tested the photon tech um x 600 watt pro a beautiful fixture just a really nice fixture i'm working on my test report for that right now uh -huh. um but it gets 2.29 and you know a blurple gets one so you're getting like right. 2.3 times as much um output from the mm -hmm. same amount of electricity so you would have to run um this 600 watt fixture that i got out there you'd have to run 1500 watts through a blurple right, in order yeah, to yeah. get 
as much light. Right, which goes back to what you were saying, how it's actually like more expensive and stuff, like both up front and the uh, cost of running it too, really. It's not as yeah, efficient. Yeah, so well, what just, 1,500 watts, that'd be like 10 of those Vipar Spectra right. fixtures yeah. that we were talking about, right? Even if each one of those costs you 100 bucks, which seems reasonable, yeah. um, that's 1,000 bucks. That's what the Photon Tech fixture costs. Mm. And you want to get you know, 10 cheap blurples that, that are going to draw 2.3 times as much electricity mm-hmm. um, or one sort of sleek, elegant fixture that, that uh, will save you money in the long run. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it's you're not saving. The only way you appear to be saving money with blurples is that you think you're buying more light than you actually are. Therefore, you think the light is cheaper than it actually is. Right. Um, but you're, you're, the only reason it appears cheap is just because you're buying a small light. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested to, uh, because, you know, I started out with that blur balloon, and then I, I grew in that in my two by two, and then I added, uh, I built my own um, cob with a yeah. citizen. I forget which one it was, but I, it was a well, that, that's, that's another. Let me stop and say that then. That's another good application for cops. Is they're convenient for DIY applications like that. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't very difficult at all. I, a friend gave me the parts list. I ordered it. I think it cost me like 75, 80 bucks or something. And I had this pretty badass cob. And when I yep. added that to that blurple, uh, I really noticed the difference. Mm-hmm. But then somebody handed me and actually just gifted me this. I forget what it, it's a Hypargo or something, the Hypergaro, and it's got like four of these cobs in it. And yep. I use that, and and I saw the the difference in that even more. And now um, I was yeah. Given... So you're adding light, right? If you were thinking about this in terms of usable PPF, so I'm going to encourage you to go check out the Grow Light calculator, um, yeah. see if you can get the stats that you need on your light, and you'll see you'll be able to see the usable PPF. And when you add light like that if you increase mm-hmm. the usable ppf you will notice a difference in the plants right, right. yeah um, a lot of growers equate that with like the quality of the light or the source of the light or something but it's really just because there's more of it they're yeah. like you know you're providing a higher flux yeah well, i'm actually getting ready to ditch both of that all that setup well the blurple and the, my homemade cob i haven't used those in a while yeah, And then I was just sent a Spider Farmer SF-1000. So it's a small little light, like, yep. like maybe a two-by-two two area. So I was sent one of those to kind of yep. test it and review it. Okay. Um, so I'm interested to see how that does. But I'm actually getting ready to purchase a Mars Hydro SP-3000, which is the light that you used in your video. There you go. <laughs> That's there the light that I kind of came to the conclusion that, that I... Um, yeah, yeah. I, the SP3000 is such a bigger light than the, the oh, SF1000. Yeah. Well, that's why I, I tested the SF, the Spider Farmer SF2000. I actually just mm-hmm. gave that away yesterday. Oh, um, nice. I had yeah, a, I'll give mine away too. Yeah, I had a little drawing for that. Um, the SF2000, I can tell you a little bit about how I did my test. Um, I tested it, so our official results are for a four by two area, but I, I rate it for only six square feet. I did another test in a two by three area, and it performed really well, uh, the, a much better PAR map in the, in the two by three area. So I'm thinking the SF2000 is, I mean, the grow light calculator is thinking really that it's just over six square feet. Mm-hmm. Um, it'd be interesting to see how the 1000 really does in a uh, two by two mm-hmm. space. It's a little bit over space, but it's kind of closer than the SF 2000 would have been in a, in a two by yeah. four. Um, but it, it's a really nice fixture. I really liked it. Um, I, I thought, yeah. and I, you know, it's got the sort of top end components in it now. Um, I got that at just, well, in the two by four area, which is our official results because of the the sort of protocol on on grow space, mm-hmm. um, it got two point zero five micromoles per watt. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you put a fixture into a smaller space, um, you get better distribution, but it it lowers the usable PPF, which lowers the efficiency. So mm. I, I put it in the two by three space, which I think it's better for, but it only got 1.99 um, oh. micromoles per watt in that space. Interesting. Man, that's so weird how your space can just affect that so much. Yeah, indeed. So it's the ref- it's all about reflection. Mm-hmm. Um, 
it, it's having those walls close. If you think about the light hanging above a, a eight square foot space, if you're a photon about to leave that light, you got a huge target and you're mm-hmm. probably going to hit that target. But if you make that space now only six square feet, then you have a smaller target. It becomes more likely that you as a photon are going to hit the wall before you hit the target. Oh, I see. Does that make sense? Yeah, like, it does. Yeah. If you kind of picture yourself on the edge of the, the diode, right, like ready to run out at the speed of light. Yeah. Um, you're, you're, if you move those walls in, you as a photon, you can see more wall and you sort of see less canopy area in that case. Yeah. Um, so moving those walls in increases the amount of photons that will be reflected, which means it increases the losses from reflection. Um, but it concentrates the photons into a smaller space. So even though you're losing them in reflection, you're not losing all of them, you're, you're, and you're concentrating them in the meantime. So the PAR map becomes much better and much more even as a PAR map. But the, the usable PPF is lower in that lower space just because the target is lower or smaller. Mm, that's interesting stuff. I imagine like Dr. Photon, because no one knows what he looks like or whatever. <laughs> like I imagine him like running off the light with a cape as a photon getting ready to go hit the walls. You gave me like this. Uh, yes, visual. that's him. <laughs> I actually tried to, to talk to him. I remember giving him that analogy and thinking about that too um, and telling him like, yeah, you're the photon. You are a photon. Exactly. You're a photon. <laughs> you're like, um, yeah, we've had some really interesting conversations <clears throat> about light as I was putting together that, the whole girl oh, life sure. video. Yeah, I'm sure. So what, I mean, do you have any suggestions like for the average home grower? Let's say he's got like some, I mean, I guess most people are kind of running like maybe a, you know, a three by five, three by four is kind of an average size. Um, some For tents? Well, yeah, yeah, I think most people grow in, in tents, or at least we sort of hedge towards tents. Um, a yeah, lot yeah. of people grow outside of tents, but in similar sort of shapes. So our common areas and our, like our testing protocol spaces, we do a two by two, a three by three, a four by two, a four by four, a five by five. Um, I'm going to add a two and a half by five for like the half of a five foot tent. Um, and I'm going to talk to Shane and Photon about adding a two by three. There's just a big gap in our protocol between the two by two test and the the two by four test. Um, uh-huh. You need something to sort of fill that gap precisely because of this relationship that that we're dealing with here like that spider farmer sf 2000 Mm -hmm. is a six square foot fixture that's what it can cover now Mm -hmm. if i test it in eight square feet that's going to inflate its photon efficiency whenever you test a fixture in a larger area it increases the photon efficiency Um, And that makes it look better than it actually is in comparison Mm -hmm. to other fixtures that actually can cover eight square feet. That eight square feet is the appropriate coverage for them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Does that make sense? Yeah, it's kind of hard to wrap my mind around, but I think I'm following. Yeah. So like we list that now in a two by four test, which gives it a photon efficiency of 2.05. But I think that's inflated. I think the fixture Mm -hmm. actually should cover six square feet. When we put it in a six square foot area, the photon efficiency is only 1.99. So we are making, by not sort of having that test area available, by not having a big gap between the four foot, four square foot and the eight square foot test area, we end up either um, potentially hurting fixtures that um, really should be say a fixture would cover five square feet and we end up putting it in that four square foot space Mm -hmm. that would produce that would lower its photon efficiency um and sort of cheat it because it really Mm -hmm. could cover more area at a higher efficiency um and the other way with like the spider farmer fixture we're we're testing it in too large of a space which is artificially inflating the photon efficiency Uh, so it's just a a relationship between Mm -hmm. Test area size and photon efficiency. If you put it in a larger space, you'll capture more of the photons, which means the efficiency is going to go up. Um, but that's true, even though there are going to be a lot of regions that are like at suboptimal levels, mm-hmm. right? 
So you really need, and I've been working on this. This is going to be like grow light calculator phase two will be when we get the distribution formula nailed. Um, Cause we need to think about sort of the distribution of light and how that also sort of affects um, how that would affect these things. I think that could solve this problem from a different angle basically. Mm. So do you feel like that the Mars Hydro that they're doing a you know, pretty good job, like a, a consumer, like a normal home grower like myself would be, you Absolutely. know, pre pretty safe yeah. buying a, Mars, a, a newer Mars Hydro or what about the yeah, fighter um, the, the TS series remains sort of my my main recommendations. Um, mm -hmm. We always do our, our grow light um, recommendation page too, but the, the TS yeah. series is top for that. They are entry level lights. Um, but high efficiency LED entry level lights, and they're really impressive for distributional efficiency. Yeah. So the the TS series, even though it doesn't get as high as some of these other fixtures we've been talking about in terms of photon efficiency, mm -hmm. um, it ha they have some of the best distributional efficiency that I've seen um, mm -hmm. in terms of keeping the, the center and the edge at about the same PPFD when they're placed in the right grow space. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, they get about 1.8 micromoles per watt, um, but have really an excellent distribution of light. So, and they have convenient sizes for sort of all of those different grow spaces. So yeah. for most growers, if you're looking at, at a blurple light, I would sort of throw all my weight into trying to get you to, to consider at least a TS series light. Um, just, you're going to have so much more sort of success with that. Um, mm -hmm. I've recommended probably well over a thousand growers have bought Mars TS series lights on our, on my recommendation. And I've heard mm -hmm. like nobody that's been upset about the results of it. People are amazed with what they're able to produce with them all of the time. Mm -hmm. Um, as an upgrade to that, I think that the light we've been talking about and that I sort of is the star of my new video, the SP 3000 mm -hmm. is really an amazing fixture. Um, I, I actually think it's tough for other lights to compete with. <laughs> oh, wow. So I picked a good one, huh? The SP3000? Yeah, that's yeah. the one I'm going to get. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, psh. yeah. It's, yeah, uh, I decided on that one a while ago. I just it, haven't pulled the trigger yet. It is an a truly amazing light. Check out my videos. I, I have a one yeah, video yeah. that's just the part test and review video on the SP3000, and I have this grow light physics video, which I spend an hour with the SP3000 right. getting into what it can do. Um, I, yeah, I mean, and it, it does some things that are, are truly remarkable that I've never even seen in other par maps. So it's not just like it's great for a Mars light. It's like impressive for any light in uh 20 square feet um which is a sort of notoriously difficult amount of space to cover anything above 16 is really pretty tough for fixtures mm -hmm. um but in 20 square feet two of the sp 3000s were able to get um, they would be if i put them in the other orientation they'd be able to get every square where we had one square below 500 in my test um, but they can get every square in 20 square feet, which means all 20 square feet above 500 micromoles. And while they're doing it, they're pulling 2.28 micromoles per watt. That's insane. Wow, really? It's insane. Dang. I mean, normally, I've never seen a fixture before that can get above 2.2 while keeping the whole coverage area above 500. Mm. Normally, in order to get in order to sort of juice your efficiency numbers up that high, you have to be testing it in too large of a grow space. And like we've just been talking about, if right. you put the fixture into a really large grow space, then you'll get a really high photon efficiency. Right. Um, but no, I've, I've never seen a fixture break 2.2 and still and keep all their squares. I mean, even the corners above 500. It's, wow. it's remarkable. I mean, I, I don't really even know what to say about that. If you knew grow light metrics as well as I do, you'd be like jaw dropped, right? It's like, wow, how are they doing? How is anybody going to compete with that? Um, but there are other good fixtures out there for sure. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Photon Tech fixture I was talking about. Um, it's a little bit more, but, you know, if I was setting up a, a tent and had to buy lights, I think I might be willing to invest that little bit more. Like two of the SP3000s would be about 800 bucks. Mm -hmm. um the photon tech fixture is list for a thousand i got a five percent code so that would make it 
um, nine fifty. So it's like mm. hundred fifty bucks more. Yeah. Um, but it, it's not that it produces a hell of a lot more light than the SP three thousands. I mean, that's really it produces a little bit more light than the SP three thousands, mm -hmm. but um it's more because it's just sort of a cool components and an excellent fixture and excellent build quality and all of that um but yeah the the, the sp3000s are tough to beat oh good to know man i think i'll just go ahead and pull the trigger it's like uh icing on the cake confirmation for me hearing all that yeah um, well if you watch the rest of that video i think you'd, you'd be pulling the trigger before you got to the end of it oh um, yeah yeah i'm sure I, I, I really sort of show what it can do and the fact that it's being out it's exciting that growers have an opportunity to buy these lights now because yeah you know for about a decade lights have existed led lights have existed that were more efficient than the hid lights mm -hmm. um but they were really cost prohibitive i mean and it, they've started to come down and like with the TS series lights when that launched um, last year, that was really an exciting opportunity to get like entry level growers into high efficiency lights. And it mm -hmm. still is. Those lights continue to impress me. Um, but the SP has, you know, a mean well driver as Samsung LM 301 B chips. It's got Osram 660 nanometer chips. Um, it's a freaking top of the line fixture and you get it for 400 bucks. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was looking at. What about, I mean, do you think the spider farmers are decent lights as well, from what you can tell? Yeah, no, they're definitely decent lights. Um, they're more efficient than the TS series. Um, mm -hmm. They're not, I mean, they would be, the, the shapes I'm just not as a big of a fan of. The thing that I like about the TS series is like a TS-1000 is perfect for a 2 by 2 tent. A TSL-2000 is perfect for a 4 by 2 tent. The TSW-2000 is perfect for a 3 by 3 tent. I mean, they just have the, okay. the shapes that are set up well for right. the tents that exist. The Spider Farmer fixtures seem to be a little bit off. Like, the mm. the 1000 seems like it's a little bit short of 2 by 2 coverage. Mm -hmm. The 2000, I measured it at 6 square feet, which is awkward i will say this if you have a two by three room that you're growing in a closet or something i think mm -hmm. it's the best two by three coverage fixture <laughs> but i just oh, okay. don't think that that's a really common shape yeah yeah i hear you yeah but i mean so there are options out there and we don't have to we can kind of move past this whole blurple thing and uh move there are options the out there thing. smack yourself if you're thinking about buying a blurple <laughs> to the audience out there um you're not saving money you're just buying a smaller light a smaller, less efficient light. That's what you're getting right. when you buy a blurple. You mean, and you think you're get you're spending seventy dollars, and the other one's one hundred and fifty. It's yeah, because the other one is twice as much light. I mean, and so you're right. buying half the light. That's why it, it seems to cost half the money when you really do the math in the the cost per micromole of light. You would see that. Mm. Yeah, so we just have to have discernment and do a little research. Uh, hit up Coco for cannabis.com and go to the uh, the grow light calculator and yeah, check out your yeah, grow light yeah, the grow light guide, and, the grow light calculator. I mean, I've yeah. really been trying to to put a lot of thought into that and make it simple. So if you if you come over, you're interested in learning. You spend you know an hour or so going through the articles and thinking about the calculator and then looking at lights online and coming back and plugging those numbers in the calculator. You really will sort of learn a lot about lights, I think, and end up making a better decision. Yeah. Whether you buy the lights that we're recommending or any other fixture, use those tools and use them to see what you're really getting. Um, so our calculator runs off of PPF, the photosynthetic photon flux data, as opposed to watts or other things. I mean, we're actually analyzing the amount of light that these fixtures will produce. Right. Yeah, I like that. Awesome, man. Well, thanks so much for giving us your time once again. I greatly appreciate it. If any of your people have questions or they want to follow up with any of these topics, I mean, don't just come by Cocoa for Cannabis, but I'd be happy to come back on if you start getting some of those questions and you want to do a bit of a follow-up episode with any of this. So if you're out there listening to this and you want to ask me a question about any of this stuff, or if you see the video and you'd like to, you know, get deeper into it, uh, yeah, send in a question and I'll come back on the show. Awesome. Well, Dr. MJ Coco, really appreciate your time, my friend. 
Absolutely. It's a pleasure as always. And I uh, yeah, really appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about some of this stuff. And you can see I'm pretty kind of fired up about it. It's exciting. Yeah, so I've been like really kind of dive deep into it. So yeah, we'll um, thanks to, for that. Well, Hopefully everybody enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again. Grow or love, man. Okay. Thank you, as always, for tuning in and listening. I appreciate your ears. I appreciate your comments and your messages. Be sure to check out Dr. MJ Coco's website, cocoforcannabis.com, and also check out that light physics video on YouTube if you really want to dive in to some of this stuff. I appreciate you guys. I hope you're doing well during these strange and difficult times. I hope you're growing. I hope you're happy. I hope you're joyful. I hope you guys have a good week. See ya. You and all the school parent groups about the country, and you must stand united on this and stamp out this frightful assassin of our youth. You can do it by bringing about compulsory education on the subject of narcotics in general, but great marijuana in particular. The weed marijuana is grown in every state in the union. Recently, in the city of Brooklyn, New York, a field of marijuana was found behind a tenement court. The weed was here being cultivated, regularly stripped and dried and sold in schools and at government army posts in and around New York. The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is dropped quickly and easily prepared for its market. 